on the same shows as them because when Mon was on the show, the building's electric and there's a different feel. And I mean, some people don't understand that, but it's the truth. I mean, certain people bring that, and there's a handful of them. And Mondo's one of those guys that he just he makes a wrestling show more than just an indie wrestling show. Oh gosh, so we've all wanted to see for a long, long time a battle one of the most popular wrestlers ever to grace the circles of CZW. Of all the questions I'm asked by fans, the most common is what is the most painful thing you've been through in your career as a wrestler? And without a doubt, it was taking the weed whacker to the stomach. Oh, oh, he's a weed whacker out of this. Oh, it's a human being, not a plant. Oh, oh, no. No. I'm closing my eyes. I'm closing my eyes. Excuse me! Bam! Nine! One, two, three! It's over! He won the tournament! What a finish! So explaining to somebody why I would be willing to take a weed whacker to the stomach isn't something I can just sit down and casually do, you know, in a, in a sentence or two. So the best way to explain it would be to start from the beginning, which was when I was about 15 years old. Growing up, I must have been a nightmare to my parents and teachers. Um, my head was just way too hyperactive for me to sit still in school. I didn't realize it until after I got out of high school, but I'm pretty sure I had ADD. Um, my head was just all over the place. So basically what I did to keep myself interested in school was entertain people. No, let her up. <laughs> Well, I guess I met Matt. Uh, we were about 14. We went to high school together in a little town called Denver, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun uh, in high school, just all sorts of stuff, goofing off, you know, making fun of the teachers. Hello, Slick. <laughs> Outside of school, I was even worse. Most of my free time was spent um, coming up with pranks and gags to pull. I don't call you, I don't call him nobody, don't bother me, I don't understand English. You called me yesterday, what are you talking about? You called me yesterday at one o'clock, you said you want me to come check your oil now, what are you talking about? You shit, butter. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, he okay? Oh man.
there was this local sports talk show where you could uh, listeners could call in and actually talk live on the air. And I think it's fair to say that was a pretty uh, big mistake to make with my friends and I around. Moving right along. Yeah, that, yeah, that's sports talk. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? I like the fart. <laughs> I'll tell you this what. is a rough night tonight. Yeah, we were sailing along for months. Lou must have brought all these strange yeah. people. <laughs> so it's been a great acquisition for yeah, them. Oh, absolutely. Take our next call. Welcome to Sports Talk. John, fat, Tim is pathetic, and Eric's gay. Okay. Anything else? Oh, that was nice. Yeah, Jeff? That's a perfect example. I was going to ask you know, him if he had anything intelligent to well, no, say. No, that's a per perfect example of, of some poor mother going through nine months and then right. end up with something and like that. Something like this, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a shame. And, yeah, and, 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 and you, you, you folks that are getting on and being smart guys on the air just think you're so cool. It's not intelligent. We don't need it on this show. The other listeners are offended by that. And frankly, if you don't ever call again, we don't care because we, we just won't address that kind of garbage, okay? Thanks. Let's move on to somebody intelligent. I guess those those people got offended and left. Yeah. Well, I might uh, I might cry tonight in my pillow. Matt moved away about 60 miles away, but uh, he always came back with these crazy ideas. Like, you know, he'd bring fireworks. I don't even know where he got them from. Oh, jeez. I mean, it's got the oranges coming. Three liters. Three liters of human urine. So our pranks eventually built up and got more elaborate and more serious. Goodness on the tracks. Ooh. This is going to be a really bad one, I think. This is. Huh? We got a metal barrel, a mini keg. A blue cake. Screen doors. And a really big metal barrel. Eventually the law caught up with my friends and I and uh, we started getting in trouble. We started getting fines, uh, community service, stuff like that. So it dawned on me that I probably should find something else to do to entertain myself. When I was 16, I decided to start messing around with art and um, found out that I actually had a pretty good drawing ability. Um, I like to do drawings uh, of perspective, uh, vanishing points, stuff like that. Um, charcoal was my favorite medium. I messed around with uh, black charcoal paper and white charcoal. and. Um, it really was kind of exciting for me to see um, just these expressions coming out on paper, but um, I was still way too hyperactive, and so I needed something a little more physical to entertain me. Matthew was in high school and started having ninja battles in our backyard. It was, it was all just for fun. You know, we had all these, you know, goofy outfits. I used to wear a blue wrestling singlet. I remember Matt one time had all these tight green pants. Uh, it, was, it was hilarious. And um, we weren't really hurting each other. I think I even wore like bicycle helmets or headgear the first couple times, you know, and then it was all fake. At this time, the whole backyard wrestling craze hadn't even hit the country. And so, we had no clue that other kids were even doing this stuff. And at first it was it was all funny, just you know, laughs and, and jokes. We would play music and, and you know mimic the wrestlers, but throw in a bunch of comedy. <laughs> Thank you.
backyard matches, uh, ninja battles as we call them, started to get worse after this. And a lot of it was my fault, I'm sure. They developed into full-scale ninja battles, including injuries. And of course we were concerned. So in 1998, I graduated from high school. I was gonna go to art school, but the thing is, um, my senior year, my school had me design the yearbook cover. And um, our mascot was the eagle. And um, the theme was time warp for the yearbook because our scheduling system was gonna be changing. And so I made a image of this eagle flying and stretching this clock. And um, I decorated it pretty fancy and put these um, gothic looking symbols on the clock that I had gotten from a, a book in our own school library. Well, it turned out to be this huge fiasco. Um, once the yearbooks were printed and everything, somebody noticed the symbols and accused me of putting satanic symbols on the yearbook. When um, in reality what had happened was I had divided up the um, clock wrong when I was uh, doing the design. I made 16 um, segments instead of 12, so I had extra space and I had to fill them in with something, um, the design. So I almost was unable to graduate from high school and they weren't going to hand out the yearbooks. It was this whole ridiculous thing. Um, I mean, I got past it, but it was really upsetting to me and I just didn't really want to have anything to do with art or with college after that. I toyed with the idea of joining the Marines. Um, actually, I went through with all of the signing up. Um, I did the testing for it. I was sworn in and decided like at the last minute that um, I, I really don't want to have to go off to war. But another reason why I decided I didn't want to join the Marines was because I was um, really sucked into the ECW wrestling at the time. And so I decided that I wanted to be a wrestler. And Matthew got a job building a prison with a concrete company and worked 12 hour days and worked hard all summer, saved up the money to uh, go to get trained to be a professional wrestler. There was a day when I did ask him, if I begged him not to do it, would he not do it? And he said no, he would still do it. And it was at that point that I made up my mind I wasn't going to try and stand in his way and just knew that he had to, if that was something he had to pursue on his way to manhood, then he would have to go after it and, and get over it and better while he was young than, you know, later on in life. And I remember it was late into the fall and the snow was starting and I remember putting him on a Greyhound bus in a snowstorm and 
sending him off to Ohio and thinking, well, this is what he wants to do. So I arrived in Cleveland, Ohio, January 2nd of 99, and I remember it was freezing out that night. Um, the parking lot was solid ice outside of the building. It was really a bad part of Cleveland. Um, so I was getting kind of a bad feeling at first and got up to the top where the wrestling school was. Nobody was there, um, so I took a look around the building and remember seeing all these uh, posters on the walls and pictures of wrestlers who I had recognized and, and who I had been watching in ECW and eventually found uh, the wrestling ring. No one was looking, so I hopped inside and ran the ropes a little bit back and forth. And that's, that's when I decided to stay. They gave each of us a place to stay in the actual building. Um, we each had our own mattress and we would put all our belongings around it. And um, in the kitchen we had a space for our food, each of us. Um, it, was, it was really a, a beat up, dirty warehouse building, but we didn't care because we were just there to train. Training for us was six days a week, which is really um, pretty intensive. Most training centers are usually only like two days a week, but um, this was a really um, intense uh, course, and it only lasted about 10 weeks, but um, you know everything was fresh in our heads, just kind of compacted together. And um, immediately I got out of there and started wrestling in the Cleveland area. Starting out in the indies, in independent wrestling, I realized that I still had a lot to learn. But um, that's the case with most people, you know, learning in matches, that, that's really the best way to, to figure out, you know, how to perform in front of people. Um, but somehow I always seem to leave fans happy with my matches. I always worked really hard and, you know, did the things I knew how to do and made sure those looked really good. Shortly after that, I moved back to Pennsylvania, where I had grown up, and I would take trips to Cleveland on the weekends. It was like a seven hour trip each way. Eventually, I got kind of tired of the road trips, and so looked for a place to wrestle in Pennsylvania. I came across a federation called PCW, Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, and my gimmick there, um, they called me Hardcore Nick Mondo. I would come to the ring with a cookie sheet and I, I had it all decorated up and everything. And usually uh, wind up with the cookie sheet in the hand of my opponent. And they would smack me with it and I would get pinned. And so that was my gimmick. <laughs> It went on like that for a couple months until I met a wrestler named Eddie Valentine. And they uh, put us together in a singles match and we had spent some time in training um, going over the match together and him and I clicked really well um, in the ring and started training together more and more um, and became friends outside of the ring because we had so much fun wrestling together and just doing these trips. So I was gonna be moving to Minnesota to um, help my dad out with his business. He had moved, my parents had moved back to Minnesota. Um, but anyway, they turned um, our match into a feud, which is a, a series of matches uh, culminating. And um, eventually it led up to a Singapore cane match. The idea of the match was there's a Singapore cane up on a pole and um, the whole match you're battling for this cane. And the first person to get it down basically uses it as a weapon just uh, against the other opponent. So 
so that was really the first match that um, I was really proud of afterwards. It had uh, gone smoothly, um, it was a huge crowd, we kept everybody happy, um, and it was one of the first times that I really uh, shocked a crowd because the way the match went, the person who lost it had to take 10 lashings from the Singapore cane. And um, I had told Eddie, I was like, don't hold back on the cane shots. And um, it was actually, the cane we used in the match was completely destroyed. So the one he used on me for the lashings was a brand new one. And it was, at the time, the most painful thing I had uh, taken in wrestling. <laughs> So in the summer of 2000, I arrived in Minnesota. Right before I moved to Minnesota, I had started wrestling for a company called CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling. So living in Minnesota, I would fly myself out to their shows each month. Um, I really liked wrestling for them, and so it was worth it to me. Um, my first match was against Trent Acid, and him and I um, really put on a pretty good match for my opening one. I mean, it didn't go perfectly. But we uh, did a lot of stuff, a lot of spots. Um, I took a pretty big bump through the table. I continued to work hard every show there and caught on with the fans pretty quickly, fortunately. So CZW started flying me out um, on their dollar. <laughs> Late in 2000, CZW offered me a chance to wrestle in Japan. I jumped right on the opportunity. I was just so thrilled. <laughs> Big Japan Wrestling provided each of us with uh, quite a bit of spending money while we were over there. And we had quite a few days off too, so it was my favorite part of the trip was just walking around and you know taking a look at all the interesting things over there and just seeing how different things are from the United States. Hey, we're in 7-Eleven here in uh, Fukuoka. Pretty much everything's the same as America. You know, you got gum, soda, konichiwa. Yeah, gum, soda, candy, uh, hot dogs, octopus. Oh man, check that out. Yuck. I don't think so. That looks like sponges or whatever that is. Not good. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I think that means there's no fish allowed in there. We're not fish. I'm not a fish, am I? I can go in there because I'm not a fish. No fish. No fish. I found a lot of cases where I guess they were trying to, uh, the Japanese were trying to appeal to American tourists and they would try to translate um, into English and the translations were so off a lot of the time that I found it really amusing. Okay, tell me if this makes sense. Ball hair. You need that you go to this shop if you want to add a difference to other all. Let's transform itself by permanent, a color, a cut. Miss Ball, oh, I'm on. In America, when uh, you wrestle, the, the crowds are usually just insane and yelling and chanting and booing you and just watching for every mistake. In Japan, it's a lot more uh, respectable, the, the crowds are. And it's really odd because you'll do a, a spot, you know, a series of moves. And, um, you know, if they like it, the crowd will just clap, like, 
real softly and then and then it's just like a silence again and it was so weird But just the opportunity to travel, you know, we went all the way across Japan, nine hour bus trips, just to see all the gorgeous scenery over there and uh, just to be in a completely different world um, for free, you know, to get flown over there and also to have spending money was just like the experience of a lifetime and, and really one of the best memories and best experiences I've had in all of my wrestling career. <laughs> Things really seemed to be going good for me for a while, but 2001 was actually a pretty dark period for me. Um, I guess it started with the fact that I, I didn't have a lot of the, um, you know, pranks and jokes and goofing off and just the friends that I grew up with. But um, wrestling also was a kind of a, a dull point for me. And I made the mistake of deciding to get involved in violent matches. Uh, just really kind of struggling with the whole depression thing and did a match where they actually took the ropes down from around the ring and put barbed wire in its place. The weather turned out to be um, not really even suitable for wrestling that day. It was an outdoor show and by the time my match came on it was pouring rain and to me looking back that match just really kind of epitomizes my depression. <laughs>
I eventually realized that wrestling wasn't going to keep me completely satisfied, so I decided to go to college for the first time. I found two schools in Minneapolis that I attended, um, Minneapolis College of Art and Design and Minneapolis Community and Technical College. I got back into drawing for the first time since I was in my teen years. In my first four months in college, I actually saw my abilities um, develop more than even I had in four years of high school. I also took an intro to film and video course and really spent a lot of time on a project. Uh, it included some shots from an airplane. Um, I got inside this old abandoned sewer system and, and got some awesome footage and some gorgeous shots of the city and stuff like that. So I was feeling better. I, I definitely was going back to school, but I, I still was lonely, you know? I just didn't have the friends that I had grown up with. 2002, I really saw as a turning point for me. Um, I remember it was uh, January 1st, actually, of 2002, when I was sitting doing uh, my message board, talking to fans. One day, my friend Lacey and I decided to call him up or page him and he didn't return our phone call and we're like, okay. And then like, we did it again and then he like called back and we're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? It turned out to be um, a local wrestler named Rain. Um, her real name is Bonnie, but I knew her as Rain at the time. What well, was her and her friend Lacey uh, paging me to see if I wanted to hang out. And, and I was like, sure, you know, because I, I really was lonely at the time. Well, we ended up hanging out one night and it didn't take long before we started, like, going out. At first, I thought I was just falling for this girl because I was lonely, you know, and hadn't had anybody to hang out with for a while. But came to realize that, uh, wow, you know, I really came across a, a decent girl here. And uh, so things were going much better for me. Um, my wrestling picked up from there. Um, through Bonnie, I, I met some other people. Uh, a friend of hers named Graham, um, she introduced me to him. And him and I hit it off like right away. We got into doing pranks actually, just like I had done growing up and just goofing off and all sorts of funny stuff. Ready to go? Yeah, do it. <laughs> Things were really moving forward with me with art too. I got into shooting 16mm film. It's a lot more complicated than video, but um, I really spent the time to learn the medium and um, found just as much enjoyment with that um, as I had with video. Bonnie, uh, helped me out with some of my projects too and acted for me and did a really good job. I got into sculpture, um, building things out of steel and welding them. Um, got into oil painting for the first time and uh, every painting I basically did my mom ended up stealing or my girlfriend but still it, it was it was really enjoyable for me to um, you know again be expressing myself in another form. Throughout that year, I had a couple of really memorable matches. Um, one against uh, a wrestler in CZW who had just arrived named the Messiah. And fans had always talked about um, seeing him and I wrestle in a match uh, because he lived in California. And so it was a whole different crowd over there, but it was kind of a dream match. And fortunately, it lived up to the hype and it was uh, one of the best matches I've ever had.
told you he ain't got nothing upstairs, sick Nick Bato. Messiah now throws a chair. Nails the Messiah. Nails the Messiah. Using that chair back and forth. Oh! That's it, Eric! Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, Nick Are you kidding me, Messiah? The very next weekend, I had a match in St. Paul, Minnesota, right near where I lived, against a wrestler named Horse the Psychopath. And he had been in the business for over 10 years at the time. And uh, the match turned out so well that he considers it his favorite match he's ever had. And uh, that was so flattering to me. And it really was a fantastic match. Um, everything clicked that night. Um, that night coming in, it was an eerie feeling. I mean, it really was. I'm not being dramatic. I mean, it was. It was just different. Usually I'm a lot more easygoing before the matches. But this, I felt like, uh, was going to be something. on the outside camera taking you right with him. Horace taking a little beverage from a fan at ringside right into the eyes of Nick Mondo. Oh, he throws the can at him. Loves it. He loves it. Horace and Mondo, I tell you what, we knew it. Oh my God, he's fighting him again. After everything he's been through, Horace now catches the Late 2002, CZW ran a show called Tournament of Death, and it was a show where every match is a weapon match, um, and it actually turned out being one of the nights that I'll probably most be known for in my entire wrestling career. My first round match was against Homeless Jimmy. He's another guy from California, and um, fans had wanted to see this match for a long time, too. You know what, John? You want to talk about dangerous? Fortitude. He, of course, made his way somehow here to the East Coast for this tournament. Hey, you know what? I think that homeless Jimmy's that same guy when I was coming off the exit of Route 1 was saying, we'll work for food. I may have been. Janik may be paying him off in hamburgers. Suicide, somersault, die. Tremendous move by Nick Mondo, and I wouldn't doubt that. John Zanzig's running around to get them 69 set of hamburgers and pay him. Right, enough. You better not let him hear this. And Nick Mondo now is all over him. Nick Mondo is making a statement right now. He's making a statement to White Peter. Uh oh! Power bomb. Uh oh! Bam! That'll give him some washboard abs. <laughs> the finish of that match is what really got the attention of the fans and the media, too. It ended on the top of a rider truck, and uh, down below there were tables stacked in the light tube log cabin. Oh, no! They got to be out of their minds! Almost to be blocked it. They're still up there, big right hand by Homeless Jimmy. Going for Armando Crusher. Again, we cannot see them where they are. Uh oh, Nick Mondo breaks his fall. He stops it. Remember what happened at Cage of Death 3 when Nick Mondo got thrown off of that, that stage area? The Assault Driver, 25 feet in the air. Uh oh, oh, bam, someone caught the bomb! My second round match uh, was really a shock to the fans. Messiah had been attacked just a couple weeks earlier, and he showed up unexpectedly and did a death match, um, of all things, and um, you know worked hard regardless of his injury, his taped up thumb, and it turned out again to be a very solid match. He's got to be going on adrenaline right now, and again, unfortunately for those of you that have not been following CZW or followed. Recent events in Messiah. Ah, look. And, and, and believe me when I tell you, it was a non-wrestling angle. He was attacked in his home by unidentified assailants, and his thumb was cut off. It was cut off of his hand, John. He has no thumb right now. And Nick Mondo, the son of a bitch that he is, is going to work right on it. <laughs> Good thinking there by Nick Mondo. Probably not. No, of course not. I wouldn't go either. Let the benefit of John Howes. Nick Mondo, no, the Messiah reverses. Oh, Bam! Oh, the face first. Oh. Are you kidding me, 
Messiah. Now that's entertainment, Gargiulo. Oh, is it? Cut your mouth off. Put your face off. Crucifixion bomb. Crucifixion bomb. No! Nick Mamba with enough presence of mind to... Damn, right into the corner. And I'd love to see the Messiah win. I'm not going to hide my biasness. I would love to see him walk away tonight, the winner of this tournament. You know, that's terrible, Eric. Bam! I think they're already on their way, John. I think they're halfway here. My third round match, I came in pretty beat up, but it was uh, me against the wife beater in a 200 light tube barbed wire match. Um, this was the final match of the night, so we really had to kind of crank it up a bit, and we definitely did. That almost gets there. He goes. Forget about it. It's on. I don't even know why I bother analyzing. Wife beater going face first. Takes the light tube right over the head. And now into the soft, Eric. Oh, there is salt all over the body, and that's hurting. Big kick, Tournament of Death Championship. And both of these two participants in this match very much so want to be the champion. They want to win this Tournament of Death. White Peter grabs two tubes, makes it a double. About halfway through the match, um, I was all battered and bloody. And I look up, and Wife Beater's got a bucket of salt, and he pours the thing on my back, and it was like, ah, it just, it was, oh, that was painful. On that glass and on that salt. Ah! salt into the wound. That's just sick. With the Deathmatch Championship wrapped around your tendon that's oh! your body. Mondo out of desperation. They are feeling it right now. Remember, they're at salt, poured into that ring. So everything hurts three times over. Trading shots. White like, Peter just smashing that light tube across the ear of Nick Mondo. Trading shots like Luke Skywalker and Dorg Vader in there. Uh-oh. So that was the match that finished with the Weed Whacker shot. Um, I really wanted to send fans home happy and also shocked. I mean, they had seen a whole night of violence, so I was like, you know, how am I going to top everything that happened that night? And so I, I took the Weed Whacker to the stomach and much against uh, the will of a lot of the other people in the locker room. They were telling me I shouldn't do it, but it was the most painful thing I've ever been through, but it was well worth it just for uh, all the recognition it gave CZW and um, just the fact that it was, I think, the perfect ending to, you know, a shocking night. So 2002 really was a great year for me all around. I saw my character reach a level of popularity with the fans that I never thought I would achieve. Of that World War II Japanese kamikaze pilot that you said he is to win that World Heavyweight title from Justice Pain. Look at the scars on the body of Nick Mondo. Those scars tell a story. They, story. they tell a story about a man that is personified through pain, through agony, through hurdles. Seconds of night at CZW. A lot of it, I believe, was due to just spending time, you know, a few years in wrestling and learning how to get crowds to react. I came up with my own arsenal of moves. Um, the Mondo Sledge, which is a corkscrew guillotine leg drop. Mondo Sledge! Game over! Game over! This video game is over for the world champion! The M. Bison, which was actually taken from the Street Fighter 2 video game. Willing to put their bodies through punishment like this just for that world title. The M. Bison! The M. Bison! Oh man, no, no, no. No. He's going for the M. Bison! M. Bison! Bam, he nailed it! He's Oh my God! Oh my God! You gotta be kidding me! No! No! My God! Holy cow! The assault driver was my most well-known finishing move. Illegal, Eric. He has a position for the assault driver. He has a position for the assault driver. Assault driver! That's it! He looks like he's going for the assault driver, Eric. He's already taken a move. Assault driver! 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 Assault driver!
and the life cutter was the final one that I came up with. Um, it was an idea of a friend of mine uh, named Adam. It was it was his idea, and uh, his version was slightly more dangerous, but I modified it so that I could do it without actually injuring people. Down by Dave Bell. He must have hit his homework. Oh, no, three in. Right again. But all of those moves were original to my character, and I think that with just the combination of um, my whole gimmick when I would come to the ring, you could really see influences from my younger years. Um, I was a big fan of the Ninja Turtles, and so that's where I incorporated a lot of the martial arts from. Here again. Oh boy. That was a hell of an impersonation he did of you. <sighs> anyway, blocking kicks left and right. These guys know each other like the book after only wrestling a couple times, and Nick Mondo comes up on the top of that exchange, lands the kick to the side of the head of Nate Webb. I want to know who Spider-Man was. I, I, would, I would say that he's the best friend of Nate Webb right about now. Another kick and a drop kick. Nick Mondo showing some impressive uh, kicking ability. Characters like the Crow from the movie that came out in 1993, I was fascinated with that film. And you can see uh, likenesses when I come to the ring from that character. So basically, I took all the things that I would like to see as a fan from a wrestler. I mean, incorporated them into my character. I mixed in every style of wrestling. Um, I mixed in high flying. He's just reckless in there. Oh! Nick Mondo springs up like a cat. Through the agility of sick Nick Mondo. With high spots. Of course, Nick Mondo lands on his feet. Red played with the reversal, lands on his feet. Super crazy doesn't know what to make of it. Super crazy with the Ozzy Moonsault. Technical wrestling. Matches against Chris Hero culminated in a 30 minute Iron Man tables and ladders match on July the 6th. Simply the best three available on Smart Mark Video. This should be more of the same. Mondo holding on to the wrist of Nate Webb, bringing the arm. Snapmare takes his opponent over. Knee into the back of Nate Webb, still holding on to that arm. Now Webb's dangerous because he's a high flyer, but also with the way he, he's got that spider stance going, even if you have him down on the ground. You really don't. You really don't. <laughs> and of course, big bumps, which is what my character was known for. That was he doing? Who's gonna strike first? He's gonna shoot Ian off the stage. He's gonna shoot Ian off the stage. Reversal of the Irish one. Nick Mondo. Holy! I combined them all into one package, and it really helped me excel and made 2002 the best year of my entire wrestling career. By the time 2003 rolled around, I was pretty certain that it was getting close to the time that I should uh, consider retiring from wrestling. My body was uh, starting to feel the culmination of everything I had been through. And, you know, I was getting more interested in art, too. And it's, it was really tough to do both, you know. It was hard for me to decide to step away from wrestling, but I really did see what I consider to be three warning signs that I needed to leave. The first one came in January of 2003. I did a match against Zandig and Nate Hatred. Um, and for some reason, I just my back really ended up getting uh, rattled in that match. I took three power bombs that um, weren't even called in that match. They just kind of uh, came about. They're like a one-man gang right now. Oh, Derek, he saw Nick Mondo down. Oh, bam! Nate Hatred, one more time. I've taken a lot of chair shots to the back in my career. 
but um, with my spine rattled in that match, um, I took a really nasty chair shot, and that seemed to worsen things a little bit more also. The second warning sign came about when I was actually out of the country in Italy. I got the opportunity to fly over and train some youngsters who were interested in getting into wrestling. Okay. Uh, my name is Giacomo. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And okay. Extreme match. This is how famous I am over here. <laughs> they already made a store about me. All they sell is like, this is, this is just all clothes that I would wear. This is the kind of stuff I wear. That's what they sell. But I had been in Italy for about one hour and we were leaving the airport and the driver had missed his exit on the freeway. Um, it was raining out, uh, the exit was right on a turn, and there was no shoulder, but he came to a stop and went to back up, and bam, we just got nailed. There was this uh, huge red truck. I saw it in the mirror, in the rearview mirror, right before it hit us. Completely wailed us. Uh, the back window smashed out, glass was flying forward, hit us in the head. Uh, the car just went uh, lurching forward. We bounced off the guardrail, and I remember he put the brakes on, and we just kept skidding. I mean, it was a terrible accident. Got back to the hotel, and I knew right away that my neck was messed up. Um, it was starting to swell up, actually. But still, I, I knew that the students um, were really looking forward to the training session, and so I went ahead and uh, trained them the following day. Again, it was, I saw it as a warning sign because it was really cool to get flown to Italy and I was considering keeping going with wrestling, you know, just getting flown places, but realized that my body is, is really starting to, you know, feel the effects of what I've been through. The third and final incident that I took as a warning came in my final uh, performance, which was Tournament of Death 2. Just a week before that show, I had broken a bone, actually three bones in my right wrist. Fans were really looking forward to this event and um, there was so much hype around it that I, I just went ahead and did it with the cast on my hand. My first round match was against JC Bailey. It was the first time we had wrestled and um, the match turned out uh, really well. We both worked a lot harder than I think people expected. It was actually my second round match, though, that uh, really shocked people. I wrestled against the owner of the company, John Zandig, and um, we started out with uh, some weapons in the ring and stuff like that. Nothing too shocking. I mean, it was brutal, but uh, what really blew people away, um, since the year before we did the rider truck, Jimmy and I, John decided we should bump it up a notch, and we actually went off the roof of the bar where we were uh, performing at which was two stories up. actually ended up overshooting the table and hitting the concrete. Um, his feet broke the table and I basically went straight to the concrete. One of the tables hit him in the back of the head and knocked him silly. Um, it was just devastating. I hit the ground and I've never been that rattled in my entire career. Um, 
I remember just laying there and for a while I couldn't even move my limbs, like my legs. And it was difficult for me to talk and I was just laying there wondering if I was even going to be able to get back up. It turned out I had punctured an artery in my back and, and I, was, I was losing just losing blood profusely. I didn't even realize it. Somehow I finished that match. And went on to wrestle another match. Um, the nurses in the back did not want to let me continue because I was bleeding so profusely. But I insisted on finishing the tournament that night, so they wrapped me up um, around my stomach and back. And uh, I somehow did the final match. I was just barely conscious. Uh, my opponent, Ian Rotten, really uh, helped carry me through that match because like, my head just was not functioning. But somehow um, finished that match and won the whole tournament. So I got home and recovered um, from my injuries and eventually watched the footage. And that was just the final message to me that, you know, I, I had taken things too far. I easily could have died going off that roof. And that was when I finally decided, you know, I just, I got to let it go. Because that night I, I finished, you know, I won the whole tournament. Um, I had the Iron Man title. I was the Iron Man champion. Um, I had been holding that belt. You know, I won the trophy, I won the whole tournament, and the fans were so behind me that night, and it was just such a spectacular night that I figured that was a pretty good place, you know, to finally say that's enough. Moving on from wrestling was really hard for me. Um, I don't consider it retiring, though. Like, a lot of people say, they're like, you know, how's it feel to be retired? It's not that way. I just see it as, you know, the end of one era and the beginning of another one for me. So I'm bummed. I'm very bummed. I'm disappointed, you know, that he's, he's retiring. I wasn't surprised. I'm happy for him if this is what he wants and this is what he, uh, you know, envisions himself doing. I, I hope that he comes back. I'm relieved that he left the wrestling business when he did. Uh, no major injuries. Uh, he's had some broken bones and some pretty nasty cuts. Of course I was sad seeing one of my favorite wrestlers go out like that. But I knew where he's coming from. After, after a tournament of that too, I knew that he couldn't go on much longer with, after what happened. And He's just a young guy and he had a lot of future plans. So now that he's retired, of course I miss him in the ring, but knowing that he's filmmaking and doing all sorts of good stuff, that's good for him because if that's what he wants to do more than wrestling, that's fine. Of course, I would always want to see him come back. I knew that it was something that would be very difficult for him. He really enjoyed it. You know, it's taken him to places around the world and he loves his fans. He enjoys the athleticism and the entertainment part of wrestling. And it's, a, it's part of his identity, you know. He enjoyed slipping into character and, and being this Nick Mondo person. And when you've done something like that for a long time, it's very hard to give it up. So I know it would be hard for him. So I'm, I'm certainly relieved, though. However, I, I keep wondering, has he really been in his last night? So of course it was tough for me to walk away from everything that I had 
worked so hard for, but I can't possibly uh, say that I feel empty-handed walking away. Uh, for one, just all of the fan support that I've had throughout the years. I've been in touch with them online. Um, I've gotten so many gifts in the mail from them. There's even a little kid who at every CZW show would uh, dress up like me, and he still does from what I hear at every show. And that alone, you know, that was, that was quite an honor. I've had fans claim that, you know, I'm indestructible or I'm a, a superhero, which is incredibly flattering to me because as a youngster, when I would uh, watch all the cartoons and the movies and stuff, I really did want to be seen in people's eyes as a superhero, and so in a way that was really accomplishing that goal for me, but I know that that really is not true. I come from a very strong um, Christian background, and as I was dealing with all these things and uh, going through all these uh, violent matches and stuff like that, I had a lot of people praying for me, and I don't doubt that that is what kept me in the condition, you know, that I'm in today. You know, the fact that I can walk around and still play sports just fine um, is just phenomenal. And it really was uh, just realizing that that increased uh, my own faith and helped me overcome a lot of the um, stuff I was dealing with inside of me that allowed me to take part in these violent matches. But that's something I'm very thankful for and the fact that I just was able to make it through all that stuff without having to suffer for the rest of my life. One of my dreams as a wrestler was to one day see my character in a video game and you know walking away from wrestling I, I was disappointed I was thinking of course that's, that's never gonna happen but then a few months after uh, getting out of wrestling I actually got the opportunity to be in a video game and just seeing that uh, come to life, you know, my character in a game. Uh, I got to fly out to California and do the voiceovers um, for my wrestling character. And um, just seeing that come to life was unbelievable. It was such a blessing just to see my dream come true that I really never thought would happen. So when I put together this documentary, I made a connection through the video game. Um, a guy named Kevin Gill passed on my documentary to XCG, um, some of his film buddies there, and they picked it up and distributed it. So it was incredible to see wrestling kind of feed right over into uh, film. That's what I'm looking into getting into now. Um, I spent a few years in school trying to decide that, but film is what I want to get into. I've been having so much fun with uh, film. I just did a project um, called the 48 Hour Film Project. It's a competition. You basically have two days to write, shoot, and direct, um, you know, produce, edit a film. And it was, my film was played in a local theater um, with all the other contestants and just sitting there watching it, uh, you know, it, it was like the beginning of a new era for me. You're home now. I love you, and I am never going to neglect you again. Neglect me? I, I don't remember being neglected. <laughs> So hopefully things just continue on in the direction that they've been going. In selling this documentary to XCG, um, I got a nice chunk of money, which I'm using to fund my next film project, which is actually my first feature-length film project. And I, it's going to take me about a year to do, but um, I'm not letting you know my whole wrestling background go yet. Um, I'm going to be acting in the film as well, and uh, there's going to be, I'm using indie wrestlers for some of the fight scenes, but it's just really cool to see all of this stuff 
um, build up. You know, my interests have changed, but luckily it's all just continuing in that upward motion, and uh, I'm very uh, fortunate for that. So I've gotten many things out of wrestling that I'm very thankful for, but by far for me, um, what I'm most thankful for was meeting Bonnie. It's been over two and a half years, and I'm still with her. We've grown so much and both matured so much together, and, and uh, she really has been the highlight of my life. I mean, I just, I never thought I would meet a girl that I, I really would click with like that. She is still in wrestling doing very well. Um, she's going to school also, and um, I travel with her to go to shows to watch her wrestle. She just got a gig in Mexico. That was her first time leaving the country. And so she's really uh, getting a lot better. Just before I had gotten into wrestling, I got the tattoo across my stomach that my character is really known for, which says, Unscarred. I knew the style that I was going to wrestle in before I even got into wrestling. I knew I was going to take a lot of risks, and um, so the meaning of it for me was signifying the fact that, um, you know, I've, I've been through all these hardships and all these uh, difficult matches, all this violence. But every single time I've gotten back up um, on my own two feet, I've gotten up on my own. And it just basically was saying that, um, you know, all the hardships in life, I'm not going to let them get me down. I mean, of course, I'm going to get caught up from time to time. But it was kind of like a symbol of confidence for me that I'm going to overcome whatever does get in my way in life.
Thank you.